our last set of notes in this chapter about gases are titled Real Behavior and Van der Waals Equation. We have a gas law, and it's called the ideal gas law. And so the ideal gas law works in most situations. Um, and in the ideal gas law, we make this assumption the gases are behaving ideally, that there are no deviants, um, that all gases are behaving sort of the same way, um, and that in a mixture of gases, it doesn't matter what the identity of the gas is, um, they're going to mix together thoroughly to make it a homogeneous mixture. And we just really think of it as being just one gas, one kind of gas particle, even if it's a mixture of gases. Well, that's not always the case. There are some times where we actually do have to take the identity of the gas into consideration in talking about the way that that gas is going to be. All right, so that's what the Van der Waals equation does. Um, so the Van der Waal equation, Van der Waal equation, is a modification of the ideal gas equation that takes into account the non-ideal behavior of real gases. Okay. So when, when is that the case? <laughs> when do gases begin to deviate from ideal behavior? What, what, what are the environmental conditions in which gases begin to misbehave or behave in a non-ideal way or deviate? from ideal behavior. Ideal gas behavior tends to diminish as volume gets smaller. As the volume of a gas, so if we compress it, compress it, compress it, as volume of gas decreases, gas particles actually do start to exert force on each other via or through their electrostatic nature and their molecular volume. So as gas molecules are crunched ever closer to one another, what we find is that some gas particles, when we say electrostatic, what we're talking about is their stickiness. And we'll talk about it later in the year their polarity, their polarity, whether they have a charge, if they're charged, if they have a positive and a negative region of the molecule. So if they're charged, then if they're polar molecules, then they will stick to one another. And that will, of course, um, that will change their pressure. Because if they're sticking to one another a little bit, if they're attracted to one another a little bit, then the force is it's going to slow themselves down. And so the force of their collisions and the frequency of their collisions are going to be less. And so the pressure is not going to be simply plugging into the ideal gas equation because they're starting to affect one another. And also their molecular volume. So how much space really are they taking? How big is this molecule? And if we're talking about a volume of gas overall, a container that's very, very tiny, well, then the volume of the actual molecule does start to come into play. How much of the available space is the molecule itself taking up? And is that allowing for freedom of motion? Okay, so here it is. <laughs> Here's the Van der Waal equation. Okay, I've crossed the other one out. Oh, that, and you guys can't, um, you can't see pencil very well, can you? Okay.
Okay, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put the book here. Okay, and you guys go ahead and I'm going to zoom. I'm going to zoom way in. Go ahead and copy. There. Go ahead and copy down the So P plus N squared A over V squared times V minus N V equals NRT. So P V equals NRT. So what this is, is this is a modification of the ideal gas law that takes into account, into account how polar or how sticky molecules are and how much space does the molecule itself actually take up. Okay, so, um, so we've got a couple of new constants in here. We've got A and we've got B. We know what N is, right? That's number of moles. And so then I guess our next question would be, well, what the heck do these two things mean? So this adjusts for pressure, and this adjusts for volume. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to solve using Van der Waals equation. And I actually have never seen the, um, I've never seen AP ask you to plug in the Van der Waals equation either. Um, but you guys, it's just plug and chug. And so you'd be, you'd be given Van der Waals equation if you had to solve using it. So don't worry, it's nothing you ever would have to um, memorize. Okay, so what, <clears throat> all right. Um, so A and B are constants that have been determined experimentally. And again, you guys, you would never be asked to memorize these things ever in a million years. All right, and so if I'm going to put the book back on here. So every gas has its own particular A value and its own particular B value. So depending on the molecule itself, depending on the gas molecule itself, its A and B constants are going to be different. Okay, so helium, here are the values for helium. Here are the values for carbon tetrachloride. All right, so. What, you might ask, are these A and B values all about? What do they correct for? Um, the value of A indicates how strongly molecules of a given type of gas attract each other. So A really is about stickiness or polarity how much one molecule of gas is attracted to another molecule of gas. Um, okay, so that's what A corrects for. A corrects for um, stickiness, how strong the molecules type of gas attract one another. Notice you guys, and it is correcting for pressure because of what I said earlier, remember that, that if molecules are attracted to one another, it's going to actually slow them down just slightly. And so the force and frequency of their collisions are going to be slightly less than one would think using the ideal gas equation because in really tiny volumes they real they will start to attract one another kind of slow each other down. Okay, B has a rough
correlation with molecular size. Okay, so um, and I don't want to say molar mass at this point, you guys, because it's not just molar mass. It also takes into account the shape of the molecule. And we haven't talked about shape yet. So um, when we talk about molecular size here, molar mass, yes, shape, yes, as well. So if I was going to ever give you a set of gases and ask you which of them is going to deviate most from, from ideal behavior, um, at this point, you guys, you don't know how to predict polarity. So you wouldn't be able to use that as an indication of which gas deviates most. The only thing that you're going to be able to use, and you're not going to be able to use shape either. So if I gave you four gases, and I said, okay, which of these four gases are going to deviate most from ideal behavior? The only judgment you could base that on at this point in the school year is the one that has the largest molar mass. That's the one that you would choose. As we get more sophisticated in our understanding of polarity, and polar molecules and shapes of molecules, then you know you you might be expected never shape, only polarity later on in the year. Um, but at this point, you guys, you choose a gas with the greatest molar mass and say that gas is going to deviate most from ideal behavior or it's going to behave the most non-ideal. All right, is that it? Are we done? Oh, here we go. That's what I just said. OK, you're not going to do this last bit. Look, there's a problem. We're not going to do it. Generally, again, you guys, what I just said, polar molecules and large molecules deviate most from ideal behavior. And at this point, we're saying large molecules, meaning the molecule that has the greatest molar mass. And really, actually looking at past AP questions, that's what it's been based on. Molar mass, and then once we can determine whether or not molecules are polar or not, Okay, so again, you guys, what are the conditions that gases tend to start deviating from ideal behavior when their volumes are very tiny, okay, when we start compressing them and pushing them really close together. Then we have to take into account how sticky are they one with another and how much space does the actual molecule itself take up. And that's it. That's the end of gases.